Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this video, we're going to be discussing schizophrenia. Now, before we get started, I want you guys to understand that schizophrenia is a very high yield topic for the USMLE Step 1 because it's very common and it's something you should definitely know when it comes to psychiatry. So, I highly recommend you guys spend time with this video. It might be a little bit long, but definitely take your time with this video. And if you guys don't already know, on our YouTube channel right here, here's the URL, we have a psychiatry playlist for the USMLE Step 1 where we're always posting a new video regularly to keep you guys updated on how to study for the USMLE Step 1, especially the psych portion. So with that being said, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And with that being said, let's begin and let's talk about schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a chronic mental disorder uh, where patients have periods of psychosis, they're going to have disturbed behavior and thought, and the main thing is that they're going to have a decline in function, and that's pretty important because that's what is usually going to cause uh, schizophrenic patients to be brought into uh, the, the clinic to your attention. So. One thing to understand about schizophrenia is that patients are going to have recurrent episodes of psychosis. Now, we've discussed psychosis in our previous video about psychosis, uh, and you can find it on the playlist. But psychosis is really important because it is a very hallmark presentation of schizophrenia. It usually occurs in medical or psychiatric disorders, i.e. schizophrenia and schizophrenic disorders in general. But it has three main manifestations that you should know about that are going to play a huge role in schizophrenia as well. And those are delusions, disorganized thought or speech, and hallucinations. So these three things are very important because they're pretty much the uh, hallmark, uh, um, the hallmark characterization of schizophrenia. So when it comes to the epidemiology, you should definitely know that you have a lifetime prevalence of 1.5% uh, chance, pretty much. That's what schizophrenia, uh, normal people have of getting schizophrenia. 1.5% chance throughout your lifetime of getting schizophrenia no matter what. But it's more prevalent in males than it is in females, and there's no given reason as to why. I put this picture right here where uh, the male is larger than the female to help you guys remember that. It's important because a lot of times in vignettes, it's going to be a male patient who's brought to you in the ER. Usually the risk factors are the same for African Americans and Caucasians. We know that for some certain diseases, race matters, but schizophrenia, not so much. And it presents earlier in men. Usually it presents around the late teens to 20s, whereas in females it presents around the 20s to 30s. That's another thing you should understand. So it's usually going to be a younger male who presents to your uh, uh, clinic. And the patients usually have an increased risk for suicide. So if you have a schizophrenic patient, you have to monitor them for suicide. You have to make sure that they are not uh, being, you know, very, very, uh, not, they don't have high risk for suicide. Because keep in mind, they're obviously going to be hearing voices. They're going to be, you know, a little depressed and down. It may cause them to lean towards suicide more than a normal healthy person. And finally, uh, there's higher rates of schizophrenia in patients or people who live in cities and those who have immigrated. I thought this was just interesting just so you guys should know. Now, one thing to understand about the risk factors is that a lot of times uh, we don't realize what causes diseases, but schizophrenia is one of the diseases that's been pretty well studied. And there's some pretty interesting findings that came out recently, uh, specifically there is a very hot button issue right now that's happening across the country that uh, people don't realize is linked to schizophrenia that often, and that is cannabis. Frequent use of the ganja, uh, the green, the, the weed, what else, whatever you want to call it, you know, Mary J, hemp, whatever, not hemp, hemp is something else, but you get my point. Frequent cannabis use is definitely associated with psychosis and schizophrenia in teens. Now, you don't hear about that when you're in high school, when your homie's like, yo, take a hit of this blunt, but yeah, you might get schizophrenia, guys, so uh, just let everyone know. Another thing that can cause schizophrenia, the risk factor, is obstetric complications. And this is very important to understand. You may be told in the history, in your patient's history on the vignette, that uh, the patient had some sort of obstetric complication like a hemorrhage when they were being born, preterm labor, an RH mismatch that could cause hemolytic disease of uh, a newborn, fetal hypoxia, or an infection that led to 
uh, uh, them probably getting schizophrenia later on down the road. So that's this is probably the more important of the two. I included cannabis just because I thought it was pretty cool. It's pretty interesting. And I didn't know that until I started studying for STEP. Now, another thing you really need to know, which is very high yield, is the diagnostic criteria. So I'm just going to write this out for you guys to understand. Make sure you memorize this slide very well because it plays a huge role when you're diagnosing a patient on USMLE Step 1 with schizophrenia as compared to other schizophrenic diseases that present very similar to schizophrenia except for when it comes to the diagnostic criteria. So commit this to memory. When it comes to diagnosing a patient, uh, you need to have two or more of the following for at least one month continuously. Okay, they must be experienced for at least one month. And these uh, are the delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech. Now, these three collectively are called positive symptoms. And if you guys are following and paying attention in this video, they're also known as uh, the symptoms of psychosis. So let's just write this out. So these are the psychotic symptoms, delusion, hallucinations, and disorganized speech, aka positive symptoms. And you also have some things called the negative symptoms. We're going to discuss that in a little bit, but keep in mind you have to also have negative symptoms. Uh, you can also have negative symptoms. Now, the symptoms must include one of the positive symptoms. So the two or more symptoms that you must have, one of them have to be these three, and then the other one can still be a positive symptom or it could be one of the negative symptoms that we're going to talk about. And finally, the symptoms must be continuous for at least six months, right? You can't have, uh, you can't have it not lasting for six months. So that's the main state, six months of continuous symptoms, and they, may, they must have uh, an experience, a period that lasts for at least one month continuous. One more thing is that uh, patients usually have ventricular megaly of the brain, and that's usually seen on imaging, and that's pretty high yield. So let's just show you a picture so you guys have a better understanding of what that means. Now, keep in mind, remember, the ventricles are the parts of your brain that you see on CT scans, uh, and there have been a lot of twin studies that have been done where they've, they've uh, uh, tested and they've looked at and compared uh, twin brains, one healthy and one schizophrenic twin. So on this left side right here, you have a healthy twin. As you can see, the lateral ventricles are normal in size and shape. And right here, you have a schizophrenic patient. So I'm going to write S and normal, N for normal. In this case, the lateral ventricles are abnormally large, right? That's not how it should be. So look at right here, they're small. And you can see that it's obviously occurring in uh, this patient. So ventricular megaly is a hallmark uh, finding that you'll see in schizophrenic patients. So when it comes to the clinical presentation, the general things you must know is that patients are going to have difficulty processing information, learning, they're going to have poor attention and memory, and they're also going to have the positive symptoms of psychosis that we talked about. So let's just write this out so you guys don't forget. So psychosis, and they're going to have these positive symptoms which are delusions, disorganized thought and speech, and hallucinations. Now when it comes to the negative symptoms, this is something that people usually struggle with, and I'm going to give you guys a very simple memory tool to keep this straight. But the negative symptoms are having a flat affect, absence of normal behavior, alogia or speech poverty, uh, unsocial personality, they don't like to be you know, close to people, and finally lack of motivation itself. So the memory tool I have for these two uh, symptomologies or these two types of symptoms is that the positive symptoms, I like to think about positive as a plus sign and plus sign means addition. So in the positive symptoms, something abnormal is being added to a person's normal behavior. Abnormal being these three things right here. Normally you don't have delusions. Normally you don't have disorganized thought and speech. And normally you're not hallucinating. So this is the abnormal things added to your normal behavior. That's the positive symptoms. The negative symptoms, again, I like to think about the negative sign. Negative sign means subtract. In negative symptoms, I think about having normal things being subtracted from normal behavior. At the end of the day, I think about schizophrenia as a normal person becoming abnormal. So how do you become abnormal? Either you add normal tendencies or you take away 
uh, sorry, either you add abnormal tendencies or you take away normal tendencies. So these normal tendencies are taken away and that leaves you with people who have a flat affect, who don't talk normally, who normally aren't social, who normally aren't motivated. And that's how I like to think about a, a, a schizophrenic patient. Now, a, a quick snapshot or a quick vignette in um, on the USMLA step one might be a older man being brought to the ER, or it could be a patient in his 20s, you know, in his 25 year old patient brought to the ER by his brother, and the brother states that he's been acting strangely. For the last eight to nine months, the patient says that his brother has been hearing voices, and he says that uh, the TV is talking to him, that he, that he has become like the savior of the world. Obviously, that's not normal. Now, he used to work as an engineer, but he quit his job and decided to pursue that. This is obviously affecting his normal day-to-day -day function of being an engineer. So it's definitely giving him, uh, you know, it's, it's putting him in the right criteria. And he seems to respond to normal stimuli, but he also jumps from topic to topic. So obviously, in this case, you've been given a lot of things that clue you into schizophrenia. But the key thing is that this has been happening for about eight to nine months. Like I said, that would let you understand that this is schizophrenia because of a six month period. It's been continuous for the past month, but it's been happening over the last eight months. The six month period is definitely the main thing you have to keep in mind. Now, when it comes to uh, the positive symptoms, like I discussed earlier, you're definitely going to have uh, delusions, which are going to be things like false beliefs. Patients might hold paranoid delusions. They might also hold grandiose delusions. And in our, in our psychosis video, we've discussed other types of delusions. But here's an example of a grandiose delusion right here patients might also show disorganized thought and speech so they may have tangential speech where they change topic from uh, really quickly they may have circumstantial speech which means they give you roundabout answers to your questions and then finally they'll have hallucinations in schizophrenia it's really important to understand that it is mainly auditory hallucinations not visual hallucinations although they can have visual hallucinations i'm not saying they won't it's usually auditory hallucinations uh, like, you know, my man Dwight right here. I don't know why, but Dwight, he just looks crazy. And then they also will probably be hearing uh, voices or sounds in their heads. This whole slide, as you can see, I made this red. This is pretty high yield. So I wrote high yield as fuck right here. So you guys remember, don't forget the symptomology of psychosis. Don't forget the hallmark uh, uh, things about uh, the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. Don't forget them at all. It's very, very important. When it comes to the pathology, the, the main things you need to know for the USMLE step one is that schizophrenia is associated with an increased amount of dopaminergic activity and a decreased amount of dendritic branching. So right here we have dopamine. They're going to have more dopamine uh, pretty much going around in their brain that's going to cause a lot of these symptoms so the loss of the dendritic spines is mainly seen uh, sorry it's seen in many regions and also you're going to have excess dopamine activity in general in many regions of the brain you'll also see the lateral ventricular enlargements like we discussed earlier these are your lateral ventricles and uh, in the CT scans of the healthy and normal twin, the healthy twin and the schizophrenic twin, you could definitely see that the lateral ventricles were enlarged in the patient who had schizophrenia. Finally, the treatment for schizophrenia is pretty straightforward. You obviously we're going to discuss more about the medications uh, for schizophrenia specifically in a later port in a later uh, uh, episode or a later video. But the mainstay is going to be atypical or second generation antipsychotics like risperidone, olanzapine, quietapine, and uh, risperidone. Sorry, uh, and uh, ziprazidone. Sorry. So these are going to be the main uh, treatments. So second, the second generation antipsychotics are the mainstay. The reason why is because they have less of uh, a side effect potential to happen in patients who are taking other like first generations uh, antipsychotics like haloperidol. 
Also, you want to give, uh, oh, one other thing to realize is these are very effective in treating the symptoms and they reduce the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, the positive symptoms being the symptoms of psychosis. So these antipsychotics are only going to take care of the, psycho the, the positive symptoms. The negative symptoms are usually very difficult to get rid of and they often persist even though uh, you have tried to treat patients uh, who have schizophrenia. Another thing you could do, which is usually given in conjunction to uh, medication, is going to be CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. I didn't write this down, but just so you guys know. Uh, social skills is another thing that they should have because remember, a lot of these patients don't have good social uh, they might be antisocial, they may not have good social skills. So you want to train them on that. Those two things in conjunction to antipsychotics, second generation antipsychotics, usually are very helpful. Now one thing to understand is that usually you want to start with a single antipsychotic and you want to select it based off of the side effect profile. Of course, as uh, second generation also have side effects, but they have less side effects than first generation, so you want to select based off of that. And it's very important to monitor the response of the treatment you're giving within the first two to four weeks. That'll give you a good idea of how a patient is going to react to that medication and that medical regimen. And over the next several months, you need to uh, adjust the, the dosage and the regimen in order to achieve the maximum effect. Now, that is pretty much um, the main thing you need to know about treatments. When it comes to complications, patients are, like we said earlier, at a high risk of you know, uh, committing suicide. 5% of all schizophrenic com commit suicide, and that's a pretty big number if you think about it. They're suffering a lot. And 10% of suicides in general occur in schizophrenics. So suicide, definitely high yield. You want to make sure you guys are screening them for suicide. And when it comes to USMLE Step 1, they may ask you, what is this patient uh, most at risk of and other than the medical side effects from the uh, sorry other than the side effects from the medications the next thing is going to be suicide many also suffer from substance abuse issues now this goes hand in hand because they may need to cope with hearing the voices they may need to cope with delusions or hallucinations so what they do is they abuse a lot of substances and this is like i said a coping mechanism uh and it's sad because this can also become a mode of suicide in and of itself now, with that being said, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And a new exciting uh, update that we guys we have for you guys is that we are posting these lectures in a podcast format on all the major podcast services out there. So just go and type in Mad Medicine and you'll be able to find us. They're completely free. They're made so if you guys are driving to the clinic, if you guys are driving to school, you guys are able to continue listening to these podcasts and absorb the information and the content. And with that being said, thank you so much for watching. Go ahead and continue on to the next video.